All right, so we have been talking about group orbitals. We went through and built ethane last time and compared that with uh, what the actual MO calculations were, and we were pretty close. Uh, then we moved on to the CH2 system, and we talked about these sort of four orbitals, which you can make from the 1s orbitals on hydrogen and then the 2s orbital on carbon and the three 2p orbitals on carbon. Uh, only one of those in this uh, linear shape, only one of those, the 2px, can overlap with the 1s orbitals on hydrogen. The others, the 2pz and the 2py, are both aligned such that those hydrogens rel uh, lie in the plane, or rather in the node of the p orbital, and thus can't interact, okay? And if we were to guess at what their energy levels were, this would be pretty close. Um, now, I asked you to think about how going from linear to bent would change things. So, what'd you come up with? We start with the lowest energy one. What do you think should happen there? Okay, about the same, just yeah. bent. <laughs> okay. Um, lower or higher in energy? Okay. So, okay, you were thinking of, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably just about the same. Don't go to sleep. Um, the, I think your text says that um, the major issue or the reason that it goes down a little bit in energy is because you have some overlap now between hydrogens, whereas before it was just bonding between carbon and the hydrogens. Now you've got a little bit of hydrogen hydrogen bonding which is exactly what we saw for the planar versus pyramidal CH3 so you're gonna get a modest very small amount of stabilization okay what do you predict for this middle orbital sorry this one here I mean it's you're gonna draw it exactly the same only bent but what do you think in terms of energy Think higher, and that is. Okay. Right. You're going from sort of direct end on overlap between carbon and hydrogens to more side by side overlap. So it's not quite as good. Yep. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen? to these p orbitals up top. Let me just make a little bit of space for us. Okay. Um, let's start with the 2pz orbital. If I start to move the hydrogens back, what do you think that's going to do? Before they were in the plane of the node, which is the xy plane, but if I move them out of that node, then what? Should be some overlap and uh, where there wasn't any before, right? And that's going to give us a much lower energy orbital. It's going to be kind of like the sigma out that we drew um, for the 
pyramidal methyl, you're going to have uh, a little lobe back here and a large lobe pointing in this direction, and this will give you the um, sigma out shape, and that's going to function sort of very much like the sigma out orbital in uh, in the pyramidal methyl. So you get substantial stabilization there. In contrast, what do you expect to happen for the 2PY orbital? No change because those uh, oops, carbon, uh, those hydrogens lie within the XZ plane, which is the node of the 2PY. If I move them back this way, they're still in that XZ plane. They're still in the node. So the 2PY orbital remains unchanged. All right. Um, so as we did in the pyramidal methyl, that's annoying. There we go. As we did in the pyramidal methyl system, uh, we've got, we'll call this a sigma CH2, a pi CH2 type orbital, the sigma out, and then just the 2PY orbital. Okay, questions about that? Anything you want to ask? Anything not making sense? Yes, why is that one so good? That one is lower in energy than the linear one? Right, one. it's not a huge amount, and it's because you get some overlap between these hydrogens as they move closer to each other. So you pick up an extra sort of bonding interaction. You know, is that one higher? And the pi one is higher because you lose some, you, you, as you move these hydrogens over, you go from having pretty good end-on-end -end overlap to less good side-by-side -side overlap. In the same way that pi bonds are weaker than sigma bonds, um, when you get rid of the end-on-end -end overlap and replace it with side-by-side -side overlap, it's not quite as good. And why is it sigma and that one pi? Like uh, it's the same molecule. We call this sigma. Uh, we use the term sigma for orbitals that are um, symmetric about the axis between two nuclei, where rotating one doesn't change the other. Um, so uh, we call this a pi orbital because if it were bonded to something else and we rotated it, that would change the orbital overlap. Whereas if this sigma out orbital were bonded to something else or if this one were bonded to something else, it wouldn't matter if you rotated it. You would still get orbital overlap. Um, that explanation will become maybe a little bit clearer if we do um, bonding in ethylene, the corresponding alkene we can do next. Okay, others? Oh, there's a plug. Okay. All right, hopefully it won't go to sleep. All right, any other issues you want to talk about there? Okay. So um, let's consider a couple of different systems like we've maybe done before with the pyramidal versus planar system. Uh, in this case, we could talk about carbenes, and we could also talk about water. So water is less weird than carbenes, so let's think about water. Water has eight valence electrons, right? We thought of it as two lone pairs and then two uh, sigma bonds between oxygen and hydrogen. Um, so with those eight electrons, I will fill up these orbitals and we'll imagine the difference 
in energy between having water be linear versus bent, all right? And the major difference, of course, I mean, there's a little bit of a change as we noted in the sigma CH2 orbital moving down a little bit when you go bent and the pi orbital moving up in a little bit. These two will probably offset each other. The major difference is this one, right? The sigma out orbital goes down in energy. So uh, this is, and, and basically what we're saying is that as you distort from linear to planar, that 2pz orbital gets to pick up some s character from the hydrogen, so that moves it quite a bit lower in energy. All right? So it's better for water to be bent than linear. Um, Interestingly, this may change your view of water. Uh, if you think about hybridization uh, in the valence bond theory, you think about water as having two equal and energy lone pairs, right? And sometimes you visualize these lone pairs as being in an sp3 type orbital. In fact, some of you perhaps when teaching fellow students may have drawn an orbital on water that looked like this or something like that. In fact, sometimes people leave out the lobes on the back for sp2 orbitals. We call those rabbit ears. Have you drawn that before? We've all done that maybe. If you haven't, that's okay. Well, good for you because actually <laughs> um, at least for water in the gas phase, that's not how it is. Uh, what our orbital uh, drawing predicts for us is you have a sigma bonding orbital, a pi bonding orbital, a sigma out bonding orbital, and then you have this, uh, yeah, the p orbital that's, that has electrons in it. So you have two different lone pairs, right? Uh, this one corresponds to what we will call an S-rich lone pair that points directly away from the hydrogens uh, out in this direction, and then you have uh, an orbital that's mostly P, and it's oriented um, perpendicular to the sigma out lone pair. Uh, and this will have, um, this can have consequences for hydrogen bonding, and we'll maybe see this again um, if we talk about non-covalent interactions and, and protein structure. Um, all right. Questions you want to ask about water? There's, I think, some evidence that actually in liquid water, this is a decent model because this arrangement allows for the most hydrogen bonding. Okay, so what we'll do now to think about carbenes, have you heard about carbenes before? I didn't really know anything about carbenes, still don't much. Um, So what's what have you under what is a carbene? <laughs> okay, a carbon with a positive charge in it, that would be a carbenium ion or a carbocation. Okay, what is a carbene though? It's kind of like there's a negative charge and a positive charge on the same carbon. Um, you can think of it that way, but it's also fine to draw a carbene like this. Um, this is a hypovalent carbon. It, doesn't, it only has six electrons. Uh, it's neutral if you, if you figure out formal charge, but uh, it's got... Uh, you would predict a lone pair in, in some sp2 
type orbital and an empty p orbital on it. And so you might predict that a carbene could react with uh, both um, a carbene could react both as an electrophile and as a nucleophile. In other words, you'll see uh, insertion, say, of carbenes into, into pi bonds as this lone pair attacks one of the carbons, uh, and then the pi bond breaks, and that attacks this carbon, and you can make cyclopropanes, stuff like that, okay? So that's carbene structure. Carbenes have six electrons, so uh, we can fill them up and we can consider linear versus bent carbenes. So let's fill them up with the six available electrons, two, four, and then what do I need to do up here? You would predict one in each with parallel spin. That's the alpha principle, which comes from what? We just learned about it in chapter 14. It had to do with letters of the alphabet. H, I, J, and K integrals. Because of the determinant? Yeah, because of the Slater determinant, you get a bonus stabilization if you have parallel spins. And that comes from the exchange uh, term. So, um, you, so yeah, uh, you would predict, and this, I believe, uh, can somebody who knows PCHEM help me? Um, what is it called when you have net spin? You got parallel spins. I forget how to call it a triplet or a singlet or whatever. I had it as a triplet in my lecture, but I was too busy this morning. Okay. So apparently, past me knows that this is a triplet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Versus this approach. Okay, where because of the distortion in geometry, now we don't have to have parallel spins. We can now fill both of them in this lower energy orbital. So uh, you would predict that um, triplet carbenes, carbenes in the triplet state would tend to be more linear, whereas carbenes in the singlet state would tend to be more bent. And there's some uh, discussion as to which state, triplet versus singlet, is the ground state for carbenes. Um, it's all about whether the, the K integral that you get, the stabilization you get by having these parallel spins, is enough to compensate for uh, the fact that your alternative puts both of those electrons in a sigma out orbital. Um, so it's not it's not totally resolved, but you can do the calculations and you can see different geometries for singlet versus triplet carbenes, which maybe we should just do. Let's see. Now, this is the point at which I want to be careful because I have to stop this recording and start a different recording. So, I'm okay, so what I was trying to illustrate there was if you think of um, the, think of the difference between linear versus bent as a continuum where here the bond angle is zero or is 180 degrees and here it's like 120 or in the case of singlet that we just saw uh, it was even tighter than that maybe 101 uh, but we'll just stick with the hybridization model but if you think about um, there being sort of a continuum between these two points as you adjust that bond angle. Um, at some intermediate value, the 2PY orbital is going to be the same, but the sigma out orbital isn't going to be quite as low in energy. And it's, so you have to think about the difference between triplet and singlet carbene at that intermediate geometry 
is the difference between these two situations. One in which you have two electrons there, so you pick up this energy difference. The other option is to have the two electrons unpaired. And the real question is, does the K integral benefit that you get from having these two overcome the difference in energy between these two? And the answer is sometimes. Yeah? And so like the energy can be trip up in a single state from between those two orbitals, or almost be a plug grab, and you'd have a minimum of something like that. Yeah, you, you would probably, and that's actually what the calculation showed us, if you want a uh, triplet, yeah, there's some minimum intermediate geometry which best balances those two factors, yeah. But in general, you'll see the triplet car carbenes have a wider bond angle than singlet carbenes, and it's because of this issue. Okay. All right. Um, Maybe let's take these orbitals and make ethylene, shall we? All right, so uh, we're going to take the bent orbitals. Okay, we'll have them here, and I guess I can shrink down that sigma out. All right, so we have energy levels here, here, get rid of that, here, and here. All right, and we'll have an analogous set of energy levels over here. We're, our goal here is just to mix two bent CH2s together. And I guess just for completeness, maybe we'll copy this and paste it over here. All right. Um, so, and our goal is to make ethylene, which we're going to consider as two CH2s that come uh, and interact with each other. So our lower energy orbital is going to be the one where we have the sigma CH2 plus the other sigma CH2. And that's going to look just exactly like you would expect. That is, we're going to have We'll draw, draw it this way. The lines are just indicating uh, the geometry of the system because we're dropping the idea of individual bonds. So this is going to look like you just put two of these sigma CH2s together side by side with no change in uh, wave function sign. And then we'll have a higher energy orbital, which will be the minus combination. And the reason this isn't, though it is the minus slash anti-bonding combination, it's not as bad as you think because the carbon S orbitals don't overlap that well and because these orbitals are still carbon-hydrogen bonding. Even though you would consider them as sort of carbon-carbon anti-bonding, they're carbon-hydrogen bonding. All right, and that's, if you go back and look at your notes on ethane, that's sort of exactly what we've got. Um, for the pi type orbitals, you're going to see the same kind of thing. You'll have a lower energy combination, which I guess we're sort of running out of space, so I'll pull these down here. You have a lower energy combination here, and you get that from side-by-side -side overlap of a pi CH2 
with the corresponding pi CH2 on the other carbon. And this will uh, look like, for all the world, like a pi bond, but unlike your typical pi bond, this is actually in the plane of the page and spans all of this space here on top and all of this space here on the bottom with the node being right there, okay? That's our uh, bonding combination. And this is bonding in both a uh, carbon, carbon sense and in a carbon-hydrogen sense. There's going to be an antibonding combination as well that should be higher in energy. Um, how much higher in energy, it's difficult to say. Uh, we'll put it like here. Um, relative number levels on these axes don't matter. Uh, we're not doing this to scale or anything. Uh, we just want to communicate that we're lower in energy here. And then we've got the higher energy minus combination, which should have basically the same situation, only we'll switch the wave function sign in between the two carbons. And as you look at this, you'll think, well, isn't that an antibonding orbital? And the answer is yes and no. It's still very carbon-hydrogen uh, bonding because you've still got in-phase overlap between carbons and hydrogens, but you do have an added node there, okay? Next, you've got the two sigma out orbitals. And as we saw before for ethane, that overlap is going to be very stabilizing. And so that's going to actually come lower in energy than the uh, minus combination for your pi uh, orbitals, for your pi uh, CH2 orbitals. This one's going to look just like you would expect for a sigma out orbital. That is, there's going to be a lot of orbital density in between the two nuclei. And then there will be a lobe here and a lobe there. And this again is one of our sort of butterfly or TIE fighter orbitals. There will be a minus combination, but that's gonna be pretty high in energy, so we won't worry about it. And then um, lastly, Let's see. We combine the two p orbitals, and this uh, should be way more straightforward. Side by side of the two p orbitals is basically what you expect for a pi bond, right? So this is going to be the pi. This is going to be what we typically think of for a pi bond. That is, um, you'll have an orbital lobe coming above the plane of the page, another behind the plane of the page. You'll have in-phase overlap here on top, and you'll have out-of-phase overlap, or in-phase overlap on the bottom with the node being in the plane of the page. This is what we would call the pi orbital. And then, of course, there would be the antibonding combination, which we probably would call the pi star, which you get by, oops. All right, so the antibonding, the pi uh, antibonding combination will be your highest orbital. Uh, and I will just need to switch the wave function signs for it to be right. Okay, and in ethylene now, you can look and see how many electrons we have. Here's our typical Lewis structure of ethene, which people call ethylene. Uh, you've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 electrons. So two, four, six, eight, 
10, 12. So your highest energy orbital for your ethylene is the pi orbital. We'll call that the HOMO, highest occupied molecular orbital. Your lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is the pi star or the LUMO. Okay. So combining, and we could do, we won't, but we could do the calculations for ethylene and um, that would give us that would give us the uh, orbitals that look just like this. I'm sorry, I'm trying to see what time it is because my iPad thinks it's January 9th at 9.41 a.m. Okay, questions so far? Yeah. What would make the anti-bond then sigma out orbital higher than the pi star? What would make the like anti-bonding would... sigma orbital higher than the pi star? Yeah. Um, I think the answer there is if we tried to draw the sigma out orbital just in the same way that end on end overlap is, uh, in phase overlap is more stabilizing than side by side overlap. So I believe uh, end on end uh, out of phase interactions are more destabilizing than side by side out of phase interactions. So what, um, and this is maybe, I think, a hand wavy explanation, uh, but yeah, the idea that bringing two orbitals together like that and out of phase is destabilizing because they face each other. I, I know that's not a fundamental explanation. I guess, I guess uh, what we could fall back on is the idea that um, yeah, I guess the answer is I don't know. Um, when you do the calculations in Gaussian to see what uh, antibonding orbitals look like, the lowest energy one is one that makes a lot of sense. The higher energy ones typically don't matter at least to organic chemists because what we want to know is what the, chem the chemistry is going to happen and that almost, all, almost always involves HOMO versus LUMO. The higher energy antibonding orbitals can get quite exotic <laughs> and they can be difficult to explain. Um, so yeah, I guess I don't have a great answer for you there. Other questions? Yeah. Would that not be the LUMO? Well, if the antibonding orbital for the sigma out is higher in energy than this one, yeah, what, you, what we're going to care about is the lowest energy empty orbital, which happens to be the pi star. But we're also concerned about the LUMO too as well for the, the, this one, yeah, this current LUMO. We're also concerned about this, right? Right. Yes, we want to know about about this homo. Or, or are you asking why is this higher in energy than this? No, no. If this currently, we're not concerned about the anti, the anti bonding of the for the sigma outs. Sigma yeah. Out, yeah. But if this one currently that we, is our homo, if the other one is higher than this, we should be concerned about that, since we're concerned about homo and lumo. Right. Yes. Um, Right, I guess if, for example, the antibonding combination were for sigma out were right here, then we would fill that instead of the pi. Yeah. Um, now, all of this to say that you can draw orbitals that would be very similar to what the calculations say, but uh, most organic chemists continue to fall back on a mixture of valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. That is, most organic chemists will look at ethylene 
and they're going to say that those uh, carbons are sp2 hybridized. They're going to say that you have uh, one, two, three, four, five sigma bonds that come from overlap of a 1s orbital on, or, or rather an sp2 orbital on carbon with a 1s orbital on hydrogen, and then you have a pi bond that comes from side-by-side -side overlap of the remaining two p orbitals. Uh, and we get to the same conclusion with molecular orbital theory, only uh, we're giving up the idea that you have four identical carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds and then one carbon-carbon bond. We have uh, these one, two, three, four, five sigma-type bonding orbitals, all with overlap in the plane of the page. They're not all equal in energy. Um, but if what we care most about is homo and lumo, as long as I remember with valence bond theory that there are anti-bonding orbitals, then I can look at this and think about the sigma bonds in the conventional way, but I can see that there's a pi bond there so that I know that the pi bond is my highest energy orbital, and then there's going to be an associated pi star that's going to be lowest in energy. And that will be good enough, actually, for most things. Um, despite all the effort we're putting into uh, working with these group orbitals, uh, I don't know, Rachel, in Michael's group meetings, are you doing group orbitals all the time? No, right? But you do talk about homo and lumo pretty often, yep. All right. Okay. So I think the next thing that we could do would be to take uh, this alphabet of bent CH2 orbitals and combine them together with orbitals from oxygen to make an aldehyde. Okay? And on the side of the bent CH2, we're going to have that p orbital, we're going to have the sigma out orbital, we'll have the pi CH2 and then we'll have the sigma CH2. Uh, just remembering our coordinate system, we've said Z is here, X is here, Y is here. So, uh, and just to remind ourselves, the sigma out orbital occupies the XZ plane. Uh, the pi two, the pi CH2 orbital also occupies the XZ plane. and the sigma CH2 orbital also occupies the XZ plane, uh, where, where, whereas the P orbital is coming out and back. Now with oxygen, what are the orbitals you have available? We're not gonna, there's no need to hybridize uh, an, a single atom, an atom that's only connected to one thing. You know, sometimes we think about, oh, well the oxygen's involved in a, in formaldehyde is involved in a pi bond, therefore it must be sp2 hybridized. You don't actually need to do that. You only need to come up with hybridization when there's geometry about an atom, but when an atom, as in an aldehyde, is just at the end of the line, you can, you can work with it as though it were unhybridized. So oxygen's going to come with three degenerate p orbitals, px, py, and pz, and it's going to come up with a 2s orbital. So we can now combine these in sensible ways. The 2s orbital, remember that the sigma CH2 looks like this. So it's going to make sense because sigma CH2 contains mostly s orbitals. It's going to make sense to combine the 2s orbital from oxygen with the sigma CH2 from the bent CH2, okay? Um, the difference is going to be that unlike in ethylene where the two portions were the same in energy, you're not dealing with the same atoms now. You've got a CH2 group versus oxygen. 
So we need to decide to begin with whether there's an energy difference between those two. And this is where we fall back on the concept of electronegativity, which literally means that orbital energies are lower on those atoms because of increased effective nuclear charge. So for oxygen, what we will do for this uh, orbital is we're going to pull this down in energy relative to your sigma CH2. And next time we'll talk about the consequences. What that's going to mean is that the plus combination is going to be mostly on oxygen, whereas the minus combination is going to be mostly on carbon. And we'll work through that in greater detail next time.